solid tissue mass spectrometry is actually kind of a huge subject. And so I would just preface this in saying we're primarily here talking about performing liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry on tissue homogenates. Um, but there's, there's lots of other ways to do this. Um, you may have heard of multi imaging and sort of other techniques like that. Um, I've not had any sort of specific financial relationships with ineligible entities in the past 24 months. So I'm going to talk about why bring liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry to solid tissues, in particular FFP, frozen tissues. Um, what are some specific examples of technical capabilities, particularly those that um, kind of go beyond what we normally utilize for LCMS in the clinical testing? Talk about amyloid typing, um, our particular approach to this and how that works. And some, I'll sort of briefly uh, mention some future projects we have in the, in the pipeline. So starting with this question, why bring mass spectrometry to solid tissues? Kind of the first reason I would put forth is this ability to measure multiple or many analytes at once. We sometimes call this multiplexing. Um, this is a long-standing capability of mass spectrometry, both using targeted, untargeted acquisition approaches, and you know, this is a capability we have across small molecules and proteins, among other biomolecules. Meanwhile, this is a long-standing need for solid tissues, uh, for which we maintain hundreds of immunohistochemical stains, a list that's probably growing. Um, each of these stains requires separate validation, quality control. Cases that we receive often require multiple um, IHC stains per case to meet a standard of care. Um, but often we're sort of limited to one stain per slide, so there's sort of built-in inefficiencies and you can, uh, you can you know, run out of tissue. So mass spectrometry really offers an opportunity to consolidate our assessments for you know, analyzing tissue antigens, overall improve efficiency, and reduce tissue consumption. So the second reason I would offer is that our conventional techniques, um, you know, dependent on or largely dependent on antibody protein interactions, can fail to reflect biology. Um, the underlying issues here are many um, and have been expounded upon in you know, a variety of publications, but I think they sort of boil down to the fact that antibodies are very difficult to validate. There's a lot of batch-to-batch -batch variability. You can get one batch of antibodies and then a new batch, and it can show sort of seemingly wholly new behavior. Um, antibody reactivity in general is difficult to predict, or more specifically, cross-reactivity. And, you know, when you get an antibody from a manufacturer, often has been, you know, limitedly, sort of limited characterization has been done. And sort of as a result, mass spectrometry has um, sort of become a truth teller as a result. So sort of the more we poke it around, the more we find that um, sort of traditional assays are not sort of performing as we expect. So our exposure to this in the chemistry division, I would say, primarily comes from our, examining, our examination of circulating protein markers. But sort of many of the same lessons we would also expect to apply in solid tissues. In one prominent example, this is an article from 2013, so this is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It argued that black individuals, shown here in a darker red, overall have lower amounts of vitamin D binding protein compared to whites. This was offered as a sort of potential explanation as to why there are different or apparent differences in vitamin D levels in between races. As it kind of turned out, however, um, you know, the presence of this lower population, which sort of yielded this bimodal distribution was actually a reflection of an artifact. So the, the antibody that was used in this immunoassay was, a, was polymorphism biased and thus it had an unequal response to different sort of underlying uh, forms of vitamin D binding protein that were circulating uh, in these patients. And when you go back and reanalyze, sorry, using mass spectrometry in sort of a similar set of populations, we find that these differences sort of largely go away. So kind of the third and final reason I'll offer here is the potential for better standardization and reproducibility. So achieving harmonization and standardization for IHC has been obviously a long-standing challenge. There are numerous pre-analytical factors that affect kind of your final standing results. There's differences in antibody selection um, and of course inter-observer variability in the final interpretation. Mass spectrometry addresses these from a number of perspectives. Um, one is a focus on processing homogenized tissue, which uh, there's sort of some evidence that suggests that you know, this is maybe a more resistant way um, of dealing with pre-analytical factors. 
Um, it avoids, of course, antibody reagents, at least to protein targets. And the outputs here are largely quantitative. So this would give us a more objective readout than sort of subjective visual interpretation. So the inability to standardize IHC um, does not reflect a you know, lack of trying. I think a lot of effort has been expended to define all these pre-analytical processes that sit upstream to the final staining process from prefixation through storage, um, as well as sort of test out which of these influence the final staining result. So this is a table, this is from um, Archives of Pathology it's about 10 years ago, but it shows that variables have been investigated you know, to sort of elicit you know, what are these effects. As we kind of found over time, however, you know, these effects are antigen dependent and then often sort of subject to conflicting reports. A common theme if you look at these analytic effects is that this alterations in extent and intensity of immunostaining, which is a little bit vague, but it could speak to the effect that these variables have um, primarily in sort of the efficiency of extracting immunoreactive proteins. So kind of one underlying hypothesis we have is that if you're willing to give up on you know, maintaining morphology in certain assessments, particularly those for which it's not necessarily required, we can apply more robust or protein extraction procedures and get better results. So I would say we have at least um, circumstantial evidence for this at this point, um, including evidence that's orthogonal to mass spectrometry itself. So this was a 2012 publication uh, from our department, uh, which examined the use of multiplexed amino assays to evaluate peptide hormone expression in pituitary adenomas. Um, specifically, a, a set of 136 cases here, which included many sort of uh, purportedly null types by immunohistochemistry. Um, now, by virtue of allowing analysis ver via uh, tissue homogenate, the multiplexed amino assay was compatible with more lengthy and intense extraction procedures, as you can see here. So, IHC kind of short heating with the mild buffers, um, where there's um, multiplex amino assay. Um, we can heat up to 100 degrees C, even longer, um, and also agitate the samples in a more um, um, sort of more powerful uh, detergent. Now, for cases with IHC positive hormone expression, so overall these assays mostly agree, relatively speaking. Um, but if you look at the IHC null diagnosed cases, many in fact show a predominant hormone expression when you, you utilize the quantitative assay. Now, whether knowing this you know, would improve outcomes, I think, remains to be seen. But the, knowing the predominant hormone um, expression is considered important when guiding therapy for patients with pituitary adenoma. And I think these results show that we can probably determine um, that we probably can improve outcomes if we can dig a little bit deeper into our samples and uncover um, you know, these chemicals. So with regard to this last point, using quantitative outputs um, in place of subjective interpretation. So the idea is that we can improve uh, reproducibility and standardization by making the process of antigen, antigen evaluation more you know, objective and quantitative. So for solid tissues uh, in particular, um, particularly for solid tissues in particular, human epidermal growth factor 2 receptor um, in breast cancer tissues has been the subject of efforts um, of, to do this over the past decade. Um, so results from one of these methods is here. So this is from Amanda Pavlovich's lab at Fred Hutchinson. Um, it was performed with collaborators from here in our department. So this is actually a 23-plex targeted mass spectrometry assay um, using homogenized tissues. Again, the quantitative approach, as it did for pituitary adenomas, um, or using the quantitative approach, we can distinguish between these IHC categories. However, the, I, the quantitative analyses also show us that HER2 is measurable even in cases that were uh, scored as IHC0. Um, furthermore, these measurable levels, which have been normalized against a surrogate marker for tumor cellularity, um, overlap um, with those falling in the HER2 or HER2 low category. And the HER2 low cases would you know, generally be those that would not be treated with um, directed therapy. Um, we know from clinical trials, though, that many of these patients in the HER2 low category probably could benefit from directed therapy. So here's a, an example study of 54 patients um, in the HER2 low um, classification based on their IHC results. Normally, these patients uh, would not receive trastuzumab, um, but 
some of these patients uh, definitely had a response to the to the drug. So that's, so thus, if we can sort of more objectively delineate uh, you know these HER2 low cases, there may be imp potential to improve outcomes. So now moving on to some technical capabilities. The primary point I'd like to make here um, is that many of the technical capabilities that are being applied to solid tissues overlap with what we're already using in clinical chemistry. This would include, for example, uh, triple quadrupole mass spectrometers run on, you know, um, you know, running targeted acquisition methods. However, there are also clear differences in needs um, depending on the application. So for example, amyloid typing at least to date, has not been amenable to running targeted assays um, on low-resolution instruments. As a result, we're, we've been sort of actively introducing other capabilities into the clinical space um, over the past year, which would include technology that for a long time um, has largely been reserved for research settings. So for example, hybrid orbitrap mass spectrometry, um, untargeted acquisition types. This includes what's called data-dependent acquisition. There's also data-independent acquisition something called nanoflow chromatography, and increasingly um, the sophisticated data that we're getting out of these instruments require um, more advanced data processing capabilities. Again, sort of largely reserved to research spaces uh, until now, but for example, protein database search, um, we've been setting up clinically and have a pipeline uh, now that's operational. If you've never seen one before, this is what a hybrid orbitrat mass spectrometer looks like. This is a somewhat larger instrument than a triple quad, but it, it's still a benchtop analyzer. Um, if you were at Alexandria's talk, you heard about the triple quadrupole. This is a very simple instrument. It has a series of ion filters in a row. The, quadru the hybrid orbit trap system maintains some of these basic features, ion filtering, a, a, a zone for fragmentation, but it also brings high resolution mass analysis um, and is sort of the primary instrument in which we perform more sophisticated um, acquisition methods, such as the DDA and the DIA. So another capability we're bringing to the clinical space would be untargeted acquisition methods. Um, so again, these are typically performed on more sophisticated instruments. Um, in clinical practice, this method here, data-dependent acquisition, is actually sort of increasingly used for comprehensive drug screening, um, although we don't do that here. Um, but it's also the sort of workhorse for the past, uh, I would say, 10, 15 years for doing amyloid typing. Overall, these methods are less quantitative, but they capture more data for an even larger number of analytes. So to give you a sense of, sense of scale um, on a triple quad, you know, we look at maybe tens, I would say definitely usually much fewer than 100 targets. Whereas with an untargeted acquisition method, we acquire large numbers of spectra for thousands of, you know, for thousands of targets, so like proteins and such. So to deploy this um, clinically, we've been implementing these more, de these more sophisticated data processing capabilities, as I described. Um, in particular, we're using something called Crux Pipeline. Um, this has been scripted for us uh, through our collaborators at Genome Sciences. This, it, the, in this software, we basically provide the software a protein database and a set of MS spectra, and it goes to work. It searches the spectra against proteins in the database performs label-free quantification um, based on the spectral matches that it finds. Kind of the final additional capability we're moving from the research to the clinical, I would say, is nanoflow or nano electro spray. So this specifically references reducing our flow rates from hundreds of microliters per minute down to less than a microliter per minute, um, typically in the range of several hundred nanoliters per minute. We do this to maximize sensitivity of our process and we do this to increase ionization efficiency. Um, so the way this works is you can imagine your, your, chrom your chromatography system over here, your mass spectrometry system over here. In the electrospray process, you have charged droplets coming off an emitter, and there is competition for charge as these droplets desolvate. You can improve the efficiency and reduce competition by sort of slowing that process down um, such that more things become um, ionized. And so that's the basic concept of nano electrospray. One sort of caveat to doing this is it um, greatly reduces our, our throughput, but given the kind of caseloads I think we're expecting, it, it should be manageable. So kind of putting these in a line, these would be the series of new capabilities that we're using both for amyloid typing but also some um, other projects we have in the pipeline. We have the nanoflow system, 
Um, this actually requires a custom nano electrospray source, and then this is the Q-exactive mass spectrometer. We're generating data-dependent um, acquisition data and then processing via the so-called Crux pipeline. So now I'm going to talk about amyloid typing. So amyloidosis, um, this is a systemic disease, extracellular deposition of protein fibrils in a beta pleated sheet conformation. There's many different uh, proteins that can result in the amyloid fibril protein deposition. We stain these with Congo red, of course, but you can't necessarily tell based on morphology um, what the underlying protein is. The deposition pattern may provide clues, but it, it's um, generally not enough. Typing is critical here because treatment is type dependent. Um, so for example, you want to treat a plasma cell disorder for um, la lambda light chain um, amyloidosis with chemotherapy, um, an inflammatory process you, resulting in AA type, you, you wouldn't want to give that patient chemotherapy necessarily. Um, other types of amyloid, such as variant transthyretin, can be treated with liver transplant, uh, particularly in the setting of cardiac amyloidosis. Um, and we actually now have some anti-directed sort of therapies, or sort of anti-transthyretin directed therapies um, that can be utilized. But you have to obviously sort of define what the underlying type is um, in order to utilize the best treatment. Now, unfortunately, we now classify upwards of 40 different forms of amyloid based on the underlying protein. I don't think all of these occur necessarily as a systemic amyloidosis, but um, there's a lot of different types, and it's, it's possible to get it wrong using kind of conventional techniques. Um, and sort of on top of that, we're continually identifying new amyloidogenic proteins, and then this list is likely kind of certain to continue to grow. In practice, uh, typing is still achieved through a combination of assessments. So um, you have to have, of course, a clinical suspicion for amyloidosis, but the, the, you perform a Congo red stain and then immunofluorescence to assess lambda or light chain restriction, um, which is very central to this process. And then the results of immunofluorescence may be the primary determinants as, whether, as to whether additional typing is performed, although sort of ultimately that's up to the ordering pathologist. The clarifying tools in this, in this toolbox are the immunohistochemistry and the mass spectrometry. So a workflow for mass spec uh, for amyloid might look something like this. So here's your amyloid stain. Um, you need a mechanism for sampling. Very commonly, people try to utilize laser microdissection. You need a mechanism to extract your proteins from the tissues. You can use heat, um, sonication, uh, surfactants. We subject these homogenates to trypsin digestion and then analyze them by uh, tandem mass spectrometry. Doing the data processing requires significant bioinformatics capabilities. Um, I don't think any two institutions will probably do this the same, or quite the same. We know from a number of studies that the LCMS-based typing provides clarity, um, particularly for cases uh, in which IHC is indeterminate, or immunofluorescence appears to show immunoglobulin-driven process but there's actually another underlying non-AL form of amyloid that's present. So here's several studies, um, some of them actually relatively recent. Um, this author reported that LCMS improved diagnostic accuracy to over 90%. Um, here in this study, these reports were altered in a quarter of cases, and um, you know, some cases are non-AL types are distinguishable by LCMS can be sort of critical in guiding diagnosis and this pa these patients' treatments. So here's our amyloid typing workflow. So we use a Congo red stain as reference, and we scrape and triplicate from an unstained slide um, in an adjacent section. Um, and this results in sort of three separate tubes per case. We process batches of 24 scrapes, um, which is a number that just corresponds to the slots on a thermal mixer. Um, typically, we process um, three process level controls alongside our cases. And currently, this is a three-day protocol. This involves disruption and um, retrieval of our proteins, sorry, tissue disruption and retrieval of our proteins, um, setting up an overnight trypsin digestion, and then um, quenching that reaction and running the mass spectrometer. In terms of how this workflow integrates with our data processing, so we are analyzing each scrape separately, and each will generate a separate mass spectrometry file 
um, we have a sort of pipeline now to convert these into what's called a vendor neutral format. And then we submit this batch to what's called Crux Pipeline, which performs the key steps in our data processing, the database searching, the post-processing, aggregating counts, which relates to the spectral counting, which I'll um, talk about a little bit more, and the computing what are called normalized spectral abundance factors. The output of this that we get is a text file, and this text file contains all of our scrapes in a row in columns and proteins uh, in this column. And then we have our protein abundance data represented as these NSAF values here. Um, so thanks to uh, Bill Noble down uh, at Genome Sciences, we've been able to script this process in the pipeline. And it's, it's a one-step data processing um, operation. So normally, you'd, well, when people do this in research, you have to um, you know, open these tools and maybe run a bunch of steps in a row. That's not amenable to kind of a clinical pipeline. So we have to um, consolidate the process such that an MLS would be able to run it uh, very efficiently. And we've achieved that using um, the so-called Crux pipeline. Again, it takes a FASTA database. So this is basically one text file containing the entire sequence of the human proteome with some appended sequences for um, amyloid variants. We give it a folder of mass spectral data, and then it, it, it runs in an hour and gives us the spectral counts outputs. Again, these are quantified as normalized spectral abundance factors um, for each scrape and protein detected. Uh, so a little more on spectral counting. So these are essentially the number of, a spectral count is the number of spectra that's been assigned to one of the proteins in your database. And it's sort of a practical, semi-quantitative measure of protein abundance. We utilize something called a normalized spectral abundance factor because larger proteins contain more peptides and therefore um, they're going to have more spectra mapped against them just based on their size. So this accounts for that and sort of normalizes to the protein size such that we're comparing proteins more fairly. Now, I left out laser capture microdissection in our protocol. You may have seen that a few slides back. Um, if you're not familiar with this, this is, I would say, very common to amyloid typing by mass spectrometry. Um, it utilizes a laser to melt a polymer and pull off a specific area for sampling. Um, I know we use this for molecular genetics applications, but we don't have this instrumentation in chemistry. Now, we would point out that the original amyloid typing method, at least the, the earliest one that I can find from back in 2001, actually did not use laser microdissection. Since that time, um, the users of laser microdissection have you know, made the claim that as a result, these methods suffer from sort of high levels of sample-sample variability because you have a very, sort of a very imprecise scrape-off technique. And this has been kind of carried through um, in sort of subsequent review articles. Um, so in terms of translating amyloid typing into clinical practice, you know, laser microdissection has really been highlighted as a critical breakthrough in terms of making that possible. One, things we, one thing we would point out, though, if you look back at sort of these original methods, is that these didn't really use microdissection either. So we're scraping tissue from a slide in specified areas. Here they were using tissue sections that were loosened from it with a scalpel. And thus, there's sort of an intermediate approach that we cooked up and conceived as possible and thought, hey, we should at least try this. Um, one of the sort of technical aspect I point out here, in addition to type-specific proteins um, in evaluating our samples, we're interested in what are called what we call the PVAC proteins. So these are amyloid-associated proteins. I'm sure you're familiar with many of these. So it's serum amyloid P component, apolipoprotein E, uh, victronectin, uh, apolipoprotein A4, and clusterin. So these are proteins we expect to see in amyloid deposits, regardless of the type. So if we sampled amyloid correctly, we should see most or all of them sort of meant as an internal control and to tell us whether or not our sample is, you know, sufficiently containing amyloid. We sort of, we set cutoffs for these by taking well-characterized cases of amyloidosis that we call our control blocks and then analyzing them hundreds of times, oh, yeah, hundreds of times, and using kind of the first 100 to 120 scrapes, we set lower limit cutoffs for each of these proteins. So these are five cases across <coughs> four types. Um, there's, a, there's 100 dots here. Um, and then we set these values. So here's victronectin, apolipoprotein A4, um, clustering. So these are the minimum PVAC 
cutoffs. For all other scrapes uh, that we analyzed then, the number of PVAC proteins with NSAF above these minimum cutoffs became our PVAC score for each, uh, for each scrape. And these are just some example results. These are individual scrapes, and I've sort of added up what our PVAC scores are here. We then built rules. So these are what we call our PVAC amyloid sufficiency rules. We developed rules for individual scrapes and also for cases. So each scrape can be designated sufficient or insufficient. And we decided and then kept held to these rules that you need at least two BVAC proteins above a minimum threshold and ApoE has to be detected. Otherwise, it's insufficient. We also set rules for case as adequate, borderline, or inadequate. So these would be a case that has at least triplicate scraping. We said you need to have at least two sufficient scrapes above certain thresholds um, uh, to meet uh, the adequate cast category, or you can fall into one of the other two. So validating an assay like this is challenging because we don't have a lot of precedent. Um, we can only look to the several other laboratories that basically have this running. Um, so Mayo, for example, has published their sort of guidelines or what they would propose as guidelines for doing a validation. Um, you need some measure of accuracy. So typically we compare with a gold standard. Um, now, if your method is better than the gold standard, that can be challenging. But in our case, we had um, an outside lab that's doing this using laser microdissection. We're doing it without laser microdissection. So we were able to compare um, our results with an outside uh, laboratory. Analytical precision, they say, retesting of control box. Obviously, we did this many, many times. A lot of the other sort of categories of validation, there's not sort of a clear way forward to kind of complete the testing. Um, we completed validation or evaluation of what we call our training set. So this was 121 unique paraffin embedded tissue blocks. Um, because I'm working with Dr. Smith, a majority of these came from you know, biopsies. We also have sort of various other tissues. There were 87 unique cases of amyloidosis. And then we set aside five sort of extremely well characterized cases as our controls. Again, we analyzed in batches of 12 to 24 scrapes. Um, and then we were performing comparison, I would say, for most cases uh, with the outside laboratory performing um, laser capture and microdissection. Here's a closer look at our uh, training set specimens. You can see the different types we have here, AA type, um, A-beta-2, um, there's an insulin, um, ALEC-2, ALIS, APOA-1, APOA-4, transthyretin amyloidosis, AL, um, and then we had some other cases, uh, pretty rare, um, amyloid heavy light chain and amyloid NOS. We included in our analyses some other conditions you will find that affect the kidney. Um, the most common one is probably fibrillary glomerulonephritis. Um, well, that is the most common one. Um, for which there is sort of a known um, proteomic marker or known biomarker uh, associated with this condition. So here are results from our training set. So these are the different uh, key amyloid typing proteins. So this is SAA1. So this is serum amyloid A1, which is the type specific protein for AA type. You can see that across this case, this case, this case, we have essentially 100% sensitivity and specificity um, at, a, at a cutoff that we've been able to designate. Now, the challenge here, of course, is we don't have huge numbers of cases for all these types of amyloids. Some of these are very rare. Um, so for example, we only had one case of ApoA1, which we reevaluated four times. Um, ALECT is not um, extremely rare, but we only had a couple cases for this. Um, so these are, you know, um, values that we would monitor over time as we accumulate more data and sort of plot new data from our clinical samples and see, should we adjust our flesh thresholds over time? Um, one other thing you'll notice in this plot is I've marked the PVAC adequacy. One thing we sort of took away from doing this is that the, those PVAC uh, proteins are, I would say, relatively specific for amyloid, but they're not diagnostic. So this is not a diagnostic test for um, amyloidosis. But those markers are sensitive for amyloid. And if we don't see them or we, we, see, we see them at a borderline level, we want to convey caution to the provider. So when we, when we give these results back to, um, back to you in a report, um, you know, we, we may have that kind of sort of conversation. You can see here for the um, SAA1, 
all the quote unquote PVAC borderline or PVAC inadequate cases were kind of in this lower end. So these are cases where we go back and say, does this make sense with the clinical picture? Um, should we consider resampling and that sort of thing? Oh, and here's DNA JB9. So this, this is a protein that's been associated with uh, fibrillary gamaronephritis. Um, I just included some sample data here, but you can see that we were sort of exclusively seeing this in the fibrillary gamaronephritis uh, cases. Although we haven't, this is not formally part of the assay, but it was just sort of an interesting finding. So here are some AL kappa and AL lambda cases. So here I've, I've plotted the results for cases of amyloidosis with at least triplicate scrapings. Um, now, in general, the immunoglobulins are less specific. You're going to see them in all the cases. They're deposited in these tissues. Um, but that doesn't necessarily limit us from performing the typing. Um, the first point I would make is that none of these cases contain these other forms of amyloid um, at levels that you see here. So the first step is to evaluate, do these cases contain sort of non-AL, uh, sort of proteins we associate with non-AL amyloidosis. Once we do that, we can examine, well, do they show an excess level of, for example, lambda light chain, or the, the constant region of the lambda light chain, um, or the, uh, the IgG kappa region as well. And if they don't show excess of either of those, we can still discriminate them uh, by examining what is the, called the lambda kappa ratio. So we're essentially comparing the NSAF of the lambda constant region, uh, well, the lambda constant, lambda constant regions and the um, IgG kappa. And you can see that if you do that, um, you can discriminate the remaining number of cases. Here's the, a blow up of the low range. You can see that these two cases um, would not have been discriminated properly, but neither one was sort of what we would categorize as PVAC adequate. We applied those cutoffs that I showed you in those plots um, from the training set to an additional set of test set samples. Um, this was 27 samples. 23 of these 27 um, came from cases of amyloidosis with known type. Typing was based on finding the highest NSAF for an amyloidogenic protein relative to the cutoff I showed you in those plots. So essentially, which one has the highest signal to noise, so to speak? Um, and so for example here, this first case was defined as a trans case based on a pre-established diagnostic procedures that were performed um, clinically, such as immunofluorescence or it was a send out to Mayo for uh, amyloid typing by mass spectrometry. Here we measured an NSAF value of 0 0.06466. If I take you back to our plot here, our cutoff was 0 0.01060. And thus, the NSAF is 610% of the specificity cutoff. So that's sort of the basic idea. Where does, protein, where does a protein kind of stick out um, relative to its other potentially amyloidogenic uh, counterparts. So the data we get out of the processing looks something like this. So I showed you uh, the spectral counts format. We apply this to a template which extracts the protein uh, quantification data in NSAF uh, format. So this would be one scrape, two scrape, three scapes for a particular case. We've also pulled out the uh, PVAC uh, specific data here. In terms of what, how we report this back to the pathologist, um, so I've shown two examples here. So one is for a case of AA type amyloidosis. Um, so here the SAA1 was, as an average of the three scrapes, was significantly higher than the cutoff level. So we would have designated this as an AA type. I'm simply suggesting a type of amyloidosis, and then the remainder is just sort of um, communication with the, with the pathologist. Here's a case of AL lambda amyloidosis. Um, so this case actually had an excess of lambda, uh, sort of lambda constant region and would be typed as lambda um, or AL lambda. It did not have, for example, uh, AL, it didn't have any SA1, I guess. It didn't, it had low levels of trans um low levels of ApoA4, but it didn't have levels that jumped above those thresholds that we saw in those, those plots. So conclusions, at least for the amyloid part, um, so we would argue that amyloid testing by LCMS is possible without laser microdissection, I think as we've shown here. Um, 
you need approaches to, assa to assess sampling adequacy. Um, and we've sort of taken a crack at that using the PFAC proteins. Um, there's a lot of capabilities here that are, I would say, a jump for a lot of laboratories. If you want to deploy you know, high resolution mass spectrometry and laser mi microdissection and sort of new database searching tools, it can be too much. So, so laboratories kind of seeking to deploy these techniques should consider alternatives to things that they probably may be able to replace. So for example, in the sampling, um, you know, we gave up the laser microdissection, at least for now. Um, Crux is another thing we've been um, very happy with. Um, so we've been able to script this and sort of set it up to operate in a uh, clinical environment. Um, we have some next steps, um, including for the amyloid, um, although we, we probably will launch without these capabilities. Um, one is variant detection. So a lot of these proteins that become amyloidogenic have, can have polymorphisms or they can have mutations that make them more likely to form amyloid fibrils. And that can be of importance in terms of counseling patients or um, kind of determining the best treatment. Um, currently, we don't sort of specifically report these, but we do have a strategy for this kind of coming in the pipeline. It, and it's going to involve what's called data independent acquisition, um, but this is still not uh, yet in production, I would say. Um, through our collaborators at down the street, Mike McCoss and Hanyan Young have um, shown that this is feasible um, using DIA. And it's sort of a next step here with this assay. Some other work we have in the pipeline for solid tissues is pituitary adenoma subtyping. We can leverage a lot of the same um, infrastructure that we built here. Uh, we haven't just sort of deployed these techniques to do amyloid typing. We see this as part of a bigger project where we try to assess what are the antigens in our tissues more generally using these untargeted uh, acquisition approaches. Um, we're also working on a project with Dr. Smith related to kidney disease and COVID-19 infection. We can take the same technology and apply, sort of modulate it slightly. For example, using um, different databases that include COVID proteins and see, do we see those proteins? Are we matching spectra to those proteins in our samples? Um, I'll just point out the pituitary adenomas. Um, so this is really a multiplexing challenge in a way. So historically, these tumors have been classified on the basis of their um, sort of protein hormone expression, but um, Sort of increasingly, to meet standard of care, you also should evaluate other things like the transcription factors and, and other factors. At a certain point, it just sort of becomes, I would say, unsustainable to keep adding um, sort of additional histologic markers for these different tumors. For pituitary adenomas, in particular, um, you know, tissue exhaustion is, is definitely a problem because these can be very small. Um, there's a lot of people who have worked on amyloid typing. This was started, I would say, well before I came. Um, so I would thank everyone from Andy's lab, Michelle, Clark, Andy, um, Melissa worked on this at some point. Um, Hannah, Kelly Smith has been sampling with me since, um, since I got here in 2020. Nick has been working on uh, setting up the clinical pipeline, which is now working very well. Um, and um, yeah, thank you for listening. And um, oh, Bill Noble. <laughs> is responsible for Crux Pipeline. He, he's programmed the, the scripting of that. And then we work very closely with Mike McCoss. And Hanyan Young is a former postdoc of Mike's. And she actually sort of um, was the, sort of started doing down this road of doing amyloid typing without the laser microdissection. All right, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, that was great. Um, what, one question, I, I don't know, maybe, do you, does he need to repeat it also? I'll yeah, repeat it. Repeat You'll it. repeat it also. So uh, assumedly, when you're looking at, for an immunoglobulin, like a light chain, you said you were looking at constant regions, but assumedly there's an equal molar amount of some idiotype-specific idiotype peptide from that also. So there would assumedly be some large amount, number of peptides which are all the same, but not in your database. Is that, and is that a strategy where you could use to find uh, light chains by just looking for peptides that don't match the you know the thing, or maybe have flanking regions that are similar to that. But assumedly, the, the idiotype yeah. might be helpful too. That seems like a very complex question. But um, so our our database contains you know the sort of curated human proteome plus variants of amyloidogenic proteins kind of stuck onto the end. There's hundreds of amyloid variants. Um, we want to go down the road of assessing, for example, clonality, but 
we, we have found that not to be doable using the data dependent acquisition yet. So coming soon. Um, so Charles Elbers asked, um, do you expect mass typing? When do we expect this to be available for clinical diagnosis? So my answer to this is imminent. <laughs> um, we, have the, we have all the pieces in place now. We've, we've performed the assay validation. We've validated the data processing in the, the cloud that Nick has set up. Um, we have our procedures in place. Uh, we're waiting, I would say, on a few back, or at least one back end item uh, that I'm aware of. Um, so Mark Winner asked, um, can we measure very low abundance proteins and peptides? Could you measure uh, tissue cytokines in various tissues? Um, the answer is yes, we can measure very low abundance proteins and peptides. I think it depends on which proteins or peptides. Is, this is something you have to determine empirically um, in terms of what you're actually detecting. Could we measure cytokines? I mean, I know we measure cytokines um, when we have analyzed the, we've done some, some preliminary testing for those COVID tissues and we find cytokine proteins in those. So I know we detect them. I'm not sure which ones. It may depend on the, 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 the specifics. But yes, we can detect cytokines. Oh, yes. Um, so with how specific uh, mass spec is, did you try not scraping? Did you ever try just like pulse slide, see if you can find it in the noise? Uh, no, I did not try that. Um, so when you think about how this technology works, you are looking for, you're comparing relative abundance of proteins using these spectral abundance factors. You really want to minimize the amount of background contamination as much as possible. Uh, we kind of see the scraping under a microscope that Kelly does very precisely as an intermediate step between the laser microdissection and just sort of cleaving off a whole tissue slide. Um, I haven't tried it. I think it would work a lot poorly um, because we're primarily focused on as much as we can on that amyloid region. And we know from the PVAC regions whether or not we sampled it, but then we just need to determine what is the most abundant um, amyloid protein that's in the mix. So. I think it probably would work for some cases. I think we would see a lot of failures if we try that, is my guess. So Bill, the, the targeted things that you're trying to develop for like the pituitary adenoma, do you think we could ever get to a high flow triple pod or are we always gonna be stuck on low flow? Um, so I think that is just something that we're gonna have to test out. Um, I mean, we've seen with the, so for example, with the HER2 uh, proteins, that requires additional procedures in order to sort of bring enough sensitivity um, such that we can see what we're looking for in the sort of low expression cases. Um, so unless we're going to adapt, I would say, a, like peptide immune affinity purification or something like that, I feel like it may be challenging. I don't think it's impossible. I think we have to try it and see. Yes? So in regards to, to the beginning of the presentation when you were talking about uh -huh. using mass spec, and the limitations of immunohistochemistry. Um, yeah, so, so much of immunohistochemistry interpretation has to do with the context in which you see it. So, you know, which cells are expressing it, where right. they are architecturally. How would something like mass spec address this? So at least with, you know, performing LCMS on tissue homogenates, it wouldn't address that. But we wouldn't necessarily apply this to all applications. So obviously you're going to still need a pathology to evaluate cases where looking at the morphology is, is critical. Um, but for some things, it's probably not so important. So if you have a, like a bulk piece of tumor and you want to know what is the most abundant sort of hormone being expressed in here, I don't necessarily need to know or localize where that is. Um, so it, it's a balance. So you, if, if you have the opportunity to extract more protein from your samples and improve the sensitivity of the analysis and you're not so concerned about um, you know, localizing where it is in the tissue, I think it's worth a shot um, to see if it can sort of improve the diagnostics. That was sort of the premise of doing the, the kind of the multiplexing um, amino assay that they did with the pituitary adenomas. Um, this is the idea if you sort of grind your samples more and, and get that protein out, can you see what is sort of otherwise still not visible by IHC? Just because with IHC, you're so concerned with maintaining morphology, you can't sort of treat the slide harsh enough to get those proteins to kind of expose themselves. 
I guess is the is the premise. Oh wait, there's a, one more. Is there a potential strategy for capturing amyloid fragments in body fluids? <laughs> uh, for example, capture from the urine with solid phase Congo red, then analyze what is bound to the Congo red. Um, I think that could work, yes. Um, is there a potential strategy? Yes, I think there is a potential strategy to doing that. Um, solid tissues are, I would say, you know, these biopsies are extremely complex. That sounds like an even less, potentially less complex um, matrix from which we'd be working with. And so I would say that is probably possible. Thanks.